All right. Hello, everybody. We're just going to give you all a second to log on. Thanks for coming to share some time with us. We're super excited to uh, to launch this series. And wow, that is the fastest I've ever seen 100 people join a Zoom meeting. I feel I feel really honored and privileged to be able to be a part of this. Um, so you're we're in a mode where you can really only see us, the panelists, but we can see your chat. So please, we love it when everybody's engaged, typical bridge culture. Feel free to bop in, say hello. I would love to know what everybody ate for breakfast today. Um, just anything. I, we love to hear from you. We miss all of you. Um, and so don't, you know, at any point, toss in questions, toss in comments, anything you want. We're super stoked to uh, engage with you, even though you can only see us. But we all um, did our hair nice today so that you would <laughs> you would enjoy the experience. Hi, everybody. A second cup of coffee. Nice. Excellent. Ontario, Canada. Oh, it's so cold there. I hope you're doing well. Maybe you could get that second cup of coffee to help warm up. Bakersfield, all, all over California. Oahu, Hawaii. This is amazing. Okay. I feel really excited. Thanks for coming together. We're so just in, again, so honored to be able to do this with you. Um, a couple of like little logistical things first while we're having everyone log on, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, we are doing this training as a part of our series through the California Bridge Program. Um, we are a program in the Public Health Institute here in California. Um, and our, our goal is to get out there and improve how we take care of patients with drugs to literally save lives and kind of transform culture in our country. This series is a new spin that we're doing, um, sort of more just engaging panel style because all of us are so sick of PowerPoint. Um, and so we're doing other innovative things also. If you are a nurse or you know a nurse or you love a nurse that you would love to be engaged with us, here is a QR code that will take you to some information about our Nursing Connections series. Um, it's like a drop-in office hours, super interactive session that we're going to have. So please feel free to join us. We'd love to have you there. Um, so send this to all your nursing colleagues. And next slide. We are going to reference a couple of our resources today. As I mentioned, we're not going to bore you with slides. In fact, we don't really have very many more after this one. But uh, if you want a copy of the clinical protocols or anything that we're going to do, you can go to our website and access those things. They are free. They are there for you. They are vetted. They've got tons of like the, the citations, the resources. They're really amazing. So feel free to head there to find all kinds of stuff to support your needs. And with that said, if your specific site needs help, like you're trying to do something, you're running into barriers, you have no idea what you're doing, um, reach out to us. We love to provide technical assistance to you um, and connect you with, with some of our leadership team, help engage in, and educate your team and all of that. So don't hesitate to reach out to us and that you can follow the QR code there or on the next slide, this is how you can also get a hold of us. Feel free to hit us up on social media. You can come to our website. There's a place where you can click contact us or join us to get emails and know when these next uh, awesome training sessions are coming your way. So with all of that said, my name is Alicia Gonzalez. I'm an emergency medicine physician here in California, and I am a regional director and the clinical training lead for California Bridge, which is probably my favorite of all of my jobs. Um, and I am going to let our next two panelists who are here to engage with me introduce themselves. I'll kick it over to Eric. Hey, everyone. Excited to be here. Um, my name is Eric Anderson, and I am an ER doctor and addiction medicine doctor at Highland Hospital in Oakland, California. And between Alicia and the chat, I'm getting really excited for this. Um, I am Hannah. I am an addiction medicine doctor at UCSF in San Francisco General, and I'm one of the co-principal investigators of California Bridge. And I love talking about fentanyl. <laughs> yes. In fact, in a weird way, we, we all love talking about fentanyl, which is why we're here. And so one of the things we love to do is to design trainings that take the concerns and the questions that we're hearing from our regular, you know, clinicians on, on the ground and our substance use navigators and our nurses and address those. And the hottest topic of the past six months is fentanyl. Like, no, we cannot get through a single anything without somebody bringing up fentanyl. So obviously, for those of you who maybe don't know why that's so hot, let's start there. I mean, Eric and Hannah, why the hype? Why is fentanyl so different than all the other opioids that we talk about all the time? I think a lot of what we're going to talk about today is actually how fun fundamentally fentanyl is not as different as we might think it is, right? But fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. It's really, really potent. It has a really high affinity for the opioid receptor, and it's really effective at the opioid receptor, which means it's really strong and it comes on fast. 
Um, and for that reason, we've seen a, a big, big tragic spike in overdose deaths since fentanyl has really come on the scene. And I'll say for me in my practice in San Francisco, fentanyl is what we have now, right? It's been a long time since I've seen somebody who doesn't have fentanyl in their system. So we're worried about fentanyl because it's leading to more overdoses, because it doesn't show up on eutoxes because of that synthetic trait. Um, and also because there have been these reports coming up about more challenging buprenorphine starts or more precipitated withdrawal. So we're gonna dig into the best practices around how to start fentanyl today and, or how to start buprenorphine for folks on fentanyl today. Um, I think what we wanna say like just right off the bat before we get too far down it is we'll talk a little bit about the best way to get this done, but fundamentally we're still feeling like the buprenorphine starts that we've been doing are really, really effective and are really saving lives. And this concern of precipitated withdrawal, it's for real, it's there, but what we're seeing is that less than 1% of all buprenorphine starts have that when you follow a, a bridge type protocol. Um, I guess to step back for just a second and, and get into the basic science like we always like to do. Um, so we always think of fentanyl as a really short acting opioid, right? It comes on fast, it comes off fast. That's why we use it in the OR, that's why we use it in the ED setting a lot. But when you use fentanyl repeatedly, many, many times a day, over many weeks, many months, what you get is because it's so lipophilic, it builds up in the, in the subcutaneous fat. And so it starts to act more like a long acting opioid. And also it has really decreased renal clearance with chronic use over time. So what we see actually is that when somebody is using fentanyl many times a day, what happens is that it can take a long time for them to go into withdrawal. It can take multiple days even for somebody to start to have withdrawal. And so that's part of why we're seeing these fundamental differences uh, with fentanyl. Um, so so yeah. hold the phone. There's a couple of things you said that people were yeah. like, excuse me. Yes. Fent fentanyl doesn't show up on a Utox. Let's get into it. It depends on the Utox you have. Most opioid immunoassays, just like the quick and dirty Utox that we have, don't show fentanyl. They show uh, the natural opioids, not the synthetic opioids. Some hospitals do have fentanyl on their Utox, but many don't. And so sometimes that's why some of you who are in ER practice are seeing, and, and I know, again, we don't use Utoxes all the time in ER practice, but if you did do one on something that really looked like an opioid overdose, sometimes we see that those Utoxes are negative and that's because of fentanyl. So here we are dealing with a, a saucy and evasive little drug that we don't always even get to see in our normal testing, which is fine. That's why we always advocate listening to our patients, right? When they tell you they do fentanyl, they probably do. So just listen to what they say. Um, but it's really, really potent and, and we're not so used to it. And it lasts in people's bodies for longer. And of course we're seeing it everywhere. Like you said, it's on the news. And, and I think in conjunction with that, we've been hearing so much about more accidental overdose and more death. And so it just causes this like, stressful feeling for people that fentanyl is so much different than what we're used to, but it sounds like in some ways it is, but in a lot of ways it's not. So thinking about our work, what we do, doing MAT, what, what does that mean for us? Somebody does fentanyl, they're sitting in front of me and, and we're going to focus a lot on the ER. I'm going to throw that out there. Um, this is applicable in different settings too, but we're very much an emergency department, um, primarily sort of, of mission over here. But so what do I do here? Here I am. I'm still kind of uneasy about it, despite these things you're telling me. What's that application? What do I have to do differently or think about? So uh, maybe I can start here. I think that um, one of the things that's important to just point out before we like dive into that part is I think what we're really talking about is folks that are intentionally using a lot of fentanyl, right? And so I think there's we all know and recognize that there's fentanyl in different supplies of heroin or methamphetamines or cocaine. But I think what we all think is really interesting can be like a little bit, you know, fun to talk about and challenging clinical situations is folks who are using a lot of fentanyl, intentionally using fentanyl and doing it every day for a long period of time, right? Um, and it does present some unique challenges. And I guess I like to think of this situation as something that is, you know, maybe there are some nuances to it, but what we forget in this conversation sometimes is how important it is to start these patients on medications for opioid use disorder, how important it is to start them on bup, right? So while we might feel a little bit of hesitation or um, ap apprehension about starting somebody on bup, it's also like we cannot forget how important it is to start these patients on buprenorphine. We wanna give these folks the best chance that they can get to start bup. And when we see patients in the ED who are in withdrawal, who have objective signs of withdrawal, then we should like go for it. You know, like these are the folks that we really wanna be starting on buprenorphine. They're so, so high risk. 
Um, and so, so, so you're saying our, our fundamental goal of medication first approach is the same. It stays equally as important and it's still the priority. Exactly, exactly. And I think there are some things that are worth talking about that are a little bit different about how we're gonna approach starting patients on buprenorphine um, who are using fentanyl. Um, but you know, there is this fear about precipitated withdrawal that like we should just put out there. Um, we have a ton of experience starting patients on buprenorphine. I know a lot of you guys do too. And precipitated withdrawal is a rare thing. When you see it, you know it, and it is really dramatic. And I think with fentanyl, sometimes it can be hard to sort out patients who are truly in precipitated withdrawal that we're going to go down that pathway and folks who have worsening withdrawal that like do really well with a little bit more buprenorphine or, or, you know, more buprenorphine, or, you know, maybe they need one other medication like a benzo or something like that for some anxiety. Right. Um, but it is really uncommon. Um, you know, we have hundreds of buprenorphine starts at Highland um, that are just done through the ED. And we're also participating in this really large clinical trial at 30 sites across the country. 76% of them have fentanyl in their urines. And the cases of precipitate withdrawal are actually really, really low. They're less than 5%. So a couple of interesting questions that are popping up in the cloud. How are people then accidentally overdosing on fentanyl? We've been talking a lot about fentanyl, like it's, it's a little bit different, it's a lot the same, but how are we ending up with some people who are doing fentanyl and overdosing? Why is it more scary? Like, where is this fear coming from? If it really is still just the same process for us to go straight to MAT and give medicines, why are we so scared of it? And why do we think that it's so different when you're saying that it's kind of not from the medication treatment side of things? I can take a stab at that. Yeah. So I think there's two different groups we're talking about here, right? We're talking about people who are trying to use fentanyl, and then we're talking about people who are not trying to use fentanyl. So I have patients who are trying to buy, say, a Xanax bar, and then that's cut with fentanyl. That can lead to an accidental overdose because you don't have an opioid tolerance, right? That's one big subset of the, of the overdoses that we're seeing. But the other group is folks who are trying to use fentanyl. And fentanyl, when you buy it on the street, still has variable concentrations of fentanyl, right? It's not 100% pure. And we know it's strong. And so sometimes finding the right dose for yourself is really challenging. So when we talk about like harm reduction for people who use fentanyl, it's same, the same universal precautions as anyone else. It's like, start with a small dose, a test dose and see how you do and use around other people and make sure there's Narcan available there. So it's just, um, it's just making sure that folks have the support that they need if they are going to use, to use in the safest possible way to lower those overdose risks. And then of course, offering MAT to everybody who comes in the door who's a candidate for it. So what I hear you saying to address the question that was asked is, it's not that fentanyl in and of itself is so scary and causing all these deaths. It's that some of the time people aren't trying to do fentanyl. And so some of those overdoses you're seeing that makes fentanyl seem really scary was somebody who wasn't trying to do it in the first place. They thought they were doing something different. Is that right? Yeah, we had a couple of people all ask the same question in a row and said, I want to know that too. So it was worth doing a quick pause there. So Eric, back to what you were saying. It sounds like our typical California bridge model would still work here, right? I see somebody, I can start with, they're, they're obviously in withdrawal. Um, can I use the same cows? Do I need to do anything special when I go to start this? Should I be worried about anything besides precipitated withdrawal? Yeah, great. I, I just want to like jump into some specifics and eyeing some of these questions and uh, I guess I, I, I'm just happy to just share my approach and what I teach the residents and what we talk to other docs about. Um, so I think that it's, I think it's pretty clear and fair to say that people who are intentionally using a lot of fentanyl take longer to have withdrawal. And we need that like longer period of time before we're starting buprenorphine. I think the cows question is so fascinating, right? Like how do you apply cows to folks who are trying to use a lot of fentanyl or folks who are using heroin. And so like, it is different. I, so I, I don't think that the cow score is exactly the same for folks who are using fentanyl. So I do look for objective signs of withdrawal. And it's, I think when we're talking to ED docs, ED providers, ED PAs and MPs, like we're talking about hard and soft signs of things. So I wanna see someone who has big pupils. I wanna see some pyloerection. I wanna see somebody yawning. And if that person reports a lot of subjective symptoms within 12 hours of fentanyl use, but they don't have hard signs, I'm probably not going to start that patient on buprenorphine right away. I'm going to talk to them about how we can do a home start, which hopefully we'll talk about later because those are really interesting too. I know we'll talk about it. 
But um, if, if I see a person who's using fentanyl, um, they have hard signs of withdrawal, let's put them at 24, 36, 48 hours after their last use. I'm going to go with like my typical approach to starting them on buprenorphine. And those folks do well when they have hard signs of opioid withdrawal. Um, if you, I think that there is some component of, this is totally anecdotal and Hannah, and I mean, tell me what you guys think, but I do think that there are more subjective signs earlier in folks who are withdrawing from fentanyl before they have the harder signs, like these like clinical objective signs of withdrawal. And I do think it's really important to wait till you get those harder objective signs of withdrawal. When you do that, when someone presents, when they have those signs, these bubes are go fine. Um, those aren't the folks where we're having problems of like, is this worsening withdrawal? Is this precipitated withdrawal? Like what exactly is going on, go, going on here? So I think like this basic principle that it does take longer and look for hard signs of opioid withdrawal is a, a really safe way to start buprenorphine for these folks. So we, we always have advocated, right, in our quick start models that we're looking for a uh, cow is that includes at least one objective finding. What I feel like I'm hearing you say is with fentanyl users, at least one, ideally maybe two or three, where you can say, I, as the observer, can clinically state, yeah, you're definitely in withdrawal. Whereas sometimes with my heroin or maybe my like pill users, I've been a lot more lenient, like, ah, I trust this person that they're telling me they know they're dope sick. I'm just going to start the medicine. Is that is that a good interpretation of that? Yeah, that, that's what I would say. Like, I, I like to have two. Um, for sure. Uh, Hannah, what do you think? I'm the same. Yeah. If I can see like one or two, sometimes one, sometimes two objective signs. And I just talk to people about it. I'm like, Hey, it usually takes longer for people who use fentanyl. How long has it been for you? Do you think we've waited long enough? I'd love to see some objective signs to make sure that this goes really well for you. And usually people are really on board for that. And we'll talk it through with you. And so thinking about going through that starting process, um, just a little plug for our next training, we are going to do a deep dive into precipitated withdrawal specifically and how it happens and what it looks like and how to treat it at our next training. So those of you who are asking great questions about that, make sure you tune in with us. But for today's purposes, um, a lot of patients are worried that what's going to happen is precipitated withdrawal, uh, maybe from their own experience. So how do you recommend having a conversation with a patient? You're going to get started. Is there anything unique that you talk to them about before you start that MAT process in the emergency department? Yeah, I can start with this one. So, um, I, you know, I think that I dig into it a lot with folks generally, and I dig into it maybe more if they are intentionally using a lot of fentanyl. So I want to know, like, where are they buying their fentanyl um, in the Bay Area? Like, what color is it? We're keeping track of, like, that type of detail. Like, is this, like, the longer <laughs> acting type of fentanyl or shorter acting type of fentanyl? But I think that the most helpful questions for, like, these in-between cases were, um, I'm, I'm sort of trying to sort out, are they ready for a bup in the ED is how long does it usually take you to have significant withdrawal? Um, and have you started buprenorphine before? So folks who haven't started buprenorphine before, like, you know, they, they might not be able to like help do some shared decision making, but when patients have started bup before, they oftentimes like this worked well last time I go to the same person to get my fentanyl, you know, I know I'm ready now. And they have some hard signs, like let's, let's do it. Um, and so I think that those two questions of um, how long does it take you to get withdrawal? Have you started buprenorphine before are really particularly helpful um, for starting patients on bup um, in the ED. And, I, and like, I'm trying to monitor some of these questions. I'm missing like the vast majority. No worries. You're, um, you're doing great. Actually, we have a... Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, there, I do want to just, like, be clear. Again, we're talking about the distinction of people who are intentionally using a lot of fentanyl, people that are using heroin or something else. If they're using heroin or something else, and maybe there's some fentanyl, they're like, I don't know, who knows, but they think they're using heroin. It feels the same. Like, that typical CA bridge approach, like 12 hours, you know, cows of eight, that's totally appropriate for those patients. We're talking about this subset of patients that are using a lot of fentanyl and intentionally using a lot of fentanyl. Another life pro tip um, set in the in the comments from Ed Pilar, another one of our great physicians in our um, Centers of Excellence program at California Bridge, is just ask patients openly, have you ever had precipitated withdrawal or do you think that or do you have a friend that did that? Just like using the word yourself to open up that area for conversation. So what I'm hearing us say is it is the same. Medically, it's actually not scary or that difficult but there's a lot of fear built around it. And so perhaps the piece that's different is taking the beat to have a better conversation with your patient if what your patient uses is fentanyl. Does that seem right? Okay, 
Another couple of questions. So we still recommend starting with that eight to 16 milligram starting dose. Is it taking you more rounds of doses? Like what, what is the ultimate dose that somebody ends up going home on? Because I feel like originally with heroin, right? We were just doing eight twice a day or 16 once a day at the discharge time. Are those the doses you're doing with fentanyl too? We have a lot of people with anecdotal examples that it took a lot more than that for their patient. I'll go. Uh, so I think this is variable. I think it's, again, it's, just, I have a conversation with my patient about, have you been on this before? What do you think you're going to need? But much more often for my people who are using fentanyl daily, when I have that shared decision-making conversation, they say, I think I'm going to need a higher dose. Right. And so my fentanyl routine starts, and I think this is variable depending on who you ask are more often ending up 24, 32 milligrams a day, and sometimes even higher for the first day or two. But most of the time we're, we're shaken out around 24, 32 for, for people who use a, a fair amount of fentanyl. Rebecca Harris asked, isn't the max 36 though? <laughs> that is a great question. Um, I don't think we know the max dose of buprenorphine. I'll say that there's a different, like are we, I think that um, we're talking about in the acute period, someone's having worsening withdrawal or maybe they're having precipitated withdrawal. Like those, folks I've given a lot more than 32 milligrams of buprenorphine for, um, which is a different conversation. But for patients getting their discharge prescriptions, I, I'm with you, Hannah. I, I am starting those initial prescriptions at 24 to 32 per day. And in my outpatient addiction practice, I don't have anyone over 32 a day um, total. But those are two different things, right? Like yep. patients getting bup in the ED, um, we can do it. It's certainly a safe medication. And then, you know, like it, it, their receptor saturation saturation at some point as an outpatient on a maintenance dose is a different question. And then I definitely stop at 32. And remember for everybody who's asking so many of these questions about dosing in the chat that saying a max dose, it tends to have a lot to do with when do you saturate all the receptors, right? So a maximum dose of ibuprofen for pain we say 400. Beyond that, you're good. You've got enough of them that it should make a difference. Buprenorphine has a quote max that way too. But people who use opioids chronically, their body upregulates. It actually makes more receptors that can receive that opioid. So it's not always going to be perfectly black and white, what a quote max dose is going to be for one patient to another, or for me versus one of my patients, right? Like my body doesn't have that and somebody else's does. So there is going to be some variability. Trust that clinical judgment. Don't be afraid. And big plug, if you are afraid, remember we have those 24 hour warm lines. You can always call and get that advice. If you go to the California Bridge website and click on shift, it's got a nice little reminder of the quick protocols and it has that phone number right there for you. So if you're ever not sure, or you're, you're remembering things like limits and caps and you don't know what to do, just call a friend, phone a friend. Awesome. All right. So fentanyl is scary because it's high potency and we feel like a lot of people are dying from it, but maybe in part because some people who are dying from it, were never trying to take it in the first place. So that's a piece of it. But in the end, other than having better conversations and helping ease our patients' fears, the medication approach is the same. We start that buprenorphine, eight to 16 milligrams. We wait an hour. As long as they're improving, we keep going until they feel um, a lot better. Did we miss any of the major points that you guys have said so far? No, I'd love to talk about home starts. I know we only have a Yes, no, that's exactly what I was going to say. We've got five minutes left and Jill Hoyt and a bunch of others are mentioning. So what does this mean for my plan to do a self-start with a patient? Perfect. So this is an open question. I would say there's not a right answer here. And keep in mind that the most important thing we can do is to remember that like we should try and start these patients on buprenorphine, right? Like this shouldn't be a hesitation. I don't, I'm confused about the home start thing. Um, I, I think there's a couple ways that I'll do this and it depends a lot on the patient's experience, patient scenario, what are their social factors affecting their care, et cetera. Um, but I think that I'll tell you some buckets of what I do, and then I'm curious what Hannah's doing as well. But we are, um, so one way is to tell a person to wait longer, right? Like you need to, we need to wait, think about waiting like two days instead of 12 hours. And how can we help them do that? Well, there's a couple ways we can help them do that. Um, one is we have access to patches in the ER. I don't know if everybody else has patches, but we call this sort of like a micro macro approach where we wanna give somebody a couple patches right away in the ER even if they're not in withdrawal, tell them to wait longer, like two days, and then start a big dose of buprenorphine at that point. That's one approach. Um, 
I think there's other ways that we can help prolong some of these things with full agonists in the ER, but I think that's probably a different conversation. Um, the other one is this buprenorphine cross taper. So how do we start really low doses of buprenorphine or micro dosing is the term that people have probably heard or talked about um, for three days, seven days, something like that. I'll say that I do this for some patients from different care settings. And I think that it's really hard to do from the ED. In my experience, um, patients continuing to use fentanyl while slowly introducing buprenorphine, I think it's totally reasonable to try. Um, but I do think it's difficult sometimes for ED patients. It works amazingly well in the hospital, for example, but I think that there are some other barriers and difficulties from the ED. Um, just a few clarifications. You mentioned patches. Do you mean buprenorphine patches? Yes. So we are lucky to have butrans or buprenorphine patches. We use two times 20 microgram patches for this initial situation where someone's not really in withdrawal and we want to essentially do these sort of cross tapers, slowly introduce buprenorphine into the body over a period of time. So something like two days until someone, and then stop using fentanyl, that's our counseling. And then at two days later, then you can start sublingual buprenorphine. Um, so that is this sort of micro macro approach that we'll use sometimes that I, that, you know, I think is working to a certain extent. Um, Hannah, what do you think? You know so much about this. It's so dependent on what your patient wants to do and what the formulary is at your hospital and the insurance. Like I'm seeing all these things in the chat, right? So th there, yeah, the micro macro is an option with the butrans patches. Plenty of my patients say, you know what? I just want to wait and start eight milligrams the old fashioned way when I'm in bad withdrawal, I'll just wait longer than I used to and wait to feel pretty sick. And that's a great option. And then sometimes I have patients who say, you know what? I had precipitated withdrawal in the past and I'm just super nervous about it. And I'd rather do a cross tapering approach. Um, we uh, will drop in the chat as well, this list of all the different cross tapering approaches that you can try in the outpatient setting, depending on the formularies that you have available. Oh, great. We just put it in the chat. Um, so, so that's an option too. And it's, it's really either one of those is fine. I agree with Eric that microdosing or cross tapering is a lot more challenging out of the ED setting though. And so that's mostly for those of you who are asking about your outpatient practice. But in the ED, if they're in withdrawal, we just go for it as long as the patient's comfortable with it. And most of our patients really love that experience and, and, and have uh, appreciated just kind of getting it done. This idea with the low dose is interesting, right? Like I had a patient yesterday, he is he, we had seen him for a while and then um, returned to use. And while he did that, he's smoking two grams of fentanyl every day, but he also takes a gram of buprenorphine every day um, with the idea that that is going to sort of like help him transition back again. And he doesn't feel any difference when he takes one milligram. So this principle that you can sort of like use these low doses of buprenorphine um, clearly is something that makes sense and works for some people. Um, and I think that over, you know, over the coming months, years, who knows how long, it's really going to be interesting to see like what is the best strategy for um, patients to start one, these home starts from the ED and, and in other care settings too. Yeah, I still think what we do with pushing for self starts for the patient is kind of progressive, you know, like we're really trusting our patients. And what we've also been proving is that it works though. Our patients who want to get better, they want to do it the right way too. And so being able to counsel them um, for that is great. I'm going to do one more shout out to Ed Pilar who wrote another great tip, which is if you have a patient who's trying to wait a full 24 or 48 hours to get sick enough to really do a good job starting buprenorphine, if they have say a really high fentanyl use, like, you know, gram and a half, two gram day habit, you can also, pre you can prescribe medicines to help them get through that period of time. We still have clonidine. We still have anti-nausea and vomiting medications. There's not nothing you can do. There are some things we can do to sort of ease that process while they try to get themselves far enough um, away from their last dose to start it. So it's also really, really solid advice. Any closing thoughts, you two, before we wrap it up? Hannah? This chat is just so good. I'm going to put my email in the chat. I want to talk to you all. I wish we had time to address all of these questions. I think the moral of the story for me is that fentanyl is here. Our patients are using it. They're using it for good reason. It makes a lot of sense for people to make the decision to use fentanyl. And we need to be here to support them in a buprenorphine transition when they want to do that and combine it with harm reduction, which we're going to talk about in session three, right? Um, so we're, we're here for you. Um, the fentanyl FAQ information is coming out now, and we're going to um, look forward to talking to you more about precipitated withdrawal and harm reduction.
And the, yeah. last, the last thing I'll say is um, there, there are so many interesting things to this conversation. And I don't want anyone to forget that the most important thing is that we want to offer these patients treatment, right? Um, let's like, we cannot be um, too afraid or too hesitant to offer treatment for these patients. And we want to give patients the best chance of success. And that involves some like conversations with folks and always offering medications for OUD. Yeah. Number one takeaway, which was the point of this half an hour do MAT for fentanyl. Don't be afraid of it. You can do it. They're probably not going to go into precipitated withdrawal. And we've got a whole nother half an hour and a couple of weeks dedicated to only precipitated withdrawal. Then we'll talk about some fentanyl harm reduction stuff in another session. And then heck, if you still got more questions, we'll just keep the series going. So don't be afraid to email us other questions we didn't get to. This is just the start. Do the MAT, save lives, reach out to us if you need help. And we really appreciate all of you being here. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.